I'm a maker. I can make anything. I've done harder things than this before. I've steaked a colorwork sweater. I can sew on a pom-pom. Let me just do it. I don't have to look it up. I'm sure I know how to do this. Hello and welcome to another episode of Yarn to Table. My name is Celeste and this is a show about my knitting life. It's been a month since I've um, talked with you guys and fall is very much beginning here and so I'm really excited to start wearing hand knits and um, finishing more hand knits to wear this season and catching up with everybody on what we've all been knitting. So sitting here this afternoon with a pot of my chocolate pu'er tea, um, which is, it's unsweetened, so it's kind of a strange combination because it has that like chocolatey flavor, but, um, but I like it. And, and definitely that like, I think it's black tea is what pu'er is. Anyway, it's nice. Um, almost like a coffee kind of a feeling. Speaking of which, not to too far off on a tangent but I did order stuff to make um pour over coffee at home and it's all coming today and I am like so excited because I'm very into coffee but I've never been very good at making it so I'm trying to learn um how to make it well so that's all coming today and I'm like so freaking excited okay so <laughs> anyway um it's September 30th that I'm recording this, um, which is why I do not have on the uh, lovely bewitched hat that I, I wear for my October podcasts, <laughs> although I, I suppose this will be going live in October. I do, however, have on my new FO, um, which is the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, right before I get into that, however, I do want to just mention that we have a year-long knit along going on. If you have not watched before, you don't remember, which is the Five Request Cow. And right now, we are um, in the land of wool. It's our uh, breed-specific wool, anything but merino. More details on that in the thread uh, related to the cow. There's also details on the cow in general. Um, and lots of cool fiber details linked. Um, all that's in the doobly-doo. So you can go to the Ravelry group for the details on the cow and to participate. Um, and then there's a playlist for the, the cow videos. Um, and let's see, I am on Instagram and Ravelry is Celeste Full. If you want to follow along there, any details I don't mention about the projects can be found on um, my project pages there. And you can also use the Blogs tab from any project page to find the relevant episode of this show where I uh, talked about it, relevant episode, parentheses S, because um, sometimes several or even many episodes. A little bit of light hitting my cheek that's making me crazy. I'm gonna see if I can fix it. Nope, no fixing it. Just very bright noontime light coming in that window and I have curtains drawn completely over the window and it's still shining through. So we're gonna work with it. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like such a mess. Um, it's weird to go like a month between recording because I, I feel a little like not used to what I'm supposed to be doing and saying and anyway. It's fine. You guys are bearing with me, right? Thanks. Okay, so that is all of the announcements, yes. So um the merino, the anything but merino um portion of the cowl will be going through the end of October and then we're gonna have our last um bit, which is uh all, all the details on um that will be found in the links I mentioned. So I'm going to share with you this hat. This is Huck by Nora Gone. And I knit this out of some leftovers that I had from my Kurigami sweater. So this is um, Brooklyn Tweed Arbor, which is their beautiful uh, DK weight, 100% Columbia, no, 100% Targi wool. It is a... Um, like a three ply. Yeah, I think it's a three ply. 
It's not quite as rustic as the Tweety yarns that they use, uh, the Columbia Targi blends that they use for um, their arbor and their, uh, no, this is arbor, <laughs> their shelter and their um, whatever the fingering white one is, the Tweety yarn. Uh, but it is still far more and um, really lovely. I enjoyed working with it a lot on that sweater and also on the Guernsey wrap that I just finished, um, which, by the way, I am giving to my mother. Um, in fact, she watched the episode <laughs> where I said I was thinking about giving it to her. And she was like, I'll take it. <laughs> And I, but I had already decided I wanted to give it to her anyway. Um, so that was kind of nice. Anyway, about this hat. So I had, this This took a little bit more than, a fair amount more than, a, than one um, skein. I believe the pattern called for more than one skein, but I did extend the brim. So the brim was meant to be an inch and a half, I think. And I knit about three inches, maybe a little more, um, because I wanted a slouchier fit. And initially my concept was that I would probably wear it like this. And you can wear it like this and it has an even slouchier kind of look. Um, but I've decided I like it more folded over because it brings the cables to a more um, a place where they're more visible from the front. And it's still a little slouchy. The photos that they had of the pattern on the model were not... They were very, it, the hat was fitting very close to the, to the head. And um, so that's why I altered it, because I definitely wanted a bit more slouch in there. Um, and I was knitting it at the correct gauge, so I, I knew I wasn't going to get any kind of extra slouch. Plus, I don't, you know, you don't want to knit it off gauge with the hat to get it taller or longer, because it's also going to get wider. So, um, and with a texture like this, I, I find that you really want to go for the gauge that the pattern designer chose, especially a great designer like Nora Gon, because um, they really know what they're doing. So this was such a joy to knit. Um, it's a slightly complex cable. You'll see you have these cables interspersed with popcorn sections, and it's a five, uh, five repeats around the hat. And then the, the crown shaping works really beautifully where you can see the popcorn sections just kind of get smaller and the cable becomes this sort of point um, all around. So it's just beautifully designed. Uh, I think it looks gorgeous. I, I really fell in love with the way that it looked and I loved the idea of using this leftover yarn. I thought it would look beautiful in this color. Um, this is Vintner. But um, so I was so I was so excited to have this product, but I actually enjoyed the process of making it so much. Um, it was just an absolute joy. It has some places where you have to knit three together, um, which is just the only thing that's a little bit fiddly. Not even really fiddly so much as it's just a little bit uncomfortable, I think, for the hands. And... Um, it's funny because for me, I find that knitting three together through the back loop is not particularly challenging, um, but knitting three together regular uh, is a little uncomfortable um, for me. Uh, I don't know why I mentioned that because knitting through the back loop isn't, you can't do that to fix it and it, it's not, you know, it'll, it'll screw up the look. So that's not like a fix. I didn't do that, but I do find that to be sort of an interesting thing. Thing, simply because a lot of people don't like knitting through the back loop um, and I think it's funny how with certain decreases um, the back like the back loop is helpful and the, and the other thing I would say I mean not helpful because you can't substitute it like I said but I, I just mean like it's easier and the other thing that's interesting I don't think it was in this pattern but in other patterns I've had to purl three together and again a lot of people don't like purling as much as knitting, but when it comes to decreasing several stitches at once, I definitely think a purl three together is more ergonomic than a knit three together. So it's just kind of weird, but um, wasn't a huge fan of the knit three togethers on this. I, I think I complained about those recently. I think it was the Tanya um, had some knit three togethers. It's just something you're gonna have to have. You're gonna have to find it, you know, work through it occasionally. 
Penny might have even been more. It might have had a couple crazy, like knit five togethers or something. I just find those to be a little bit hard on the hand. But as long as there's not that many of them, it's fine. Um, what I loved so much about this, and I'll talk about cabling as well on my sock project, I've been just thrilling at cables. And the reason for it is that I... Um, I went back on the sock to cabling without a cable needle, and I've been doing it with this slightly new way of doing it, uh, which I got from the Foodie Knitting Podcast. So if you're not watching the Foodie Knitting Podcast, I'm going to go ahead and put this back on. Um, if you're not watching the Foodie Knitting Podcast, you really should be. It is, um, I don't hesitate in saying it's my favorite knitting podcast. I don't have trouble, like, I would have trouble picking favorites, except that for me, the Fruity Knitting Podcast is, like, it's just on another level. It's not just, like, one person talking about what they're doing. Uh, it involves, like, really incredible segments and um, tutorials and interviews with amazing people in the fiber arts, and and I really love the hosts. It's hosted by this couple, and sometimes their daughter comes on, and, um, and they're just really lovely people. So it's one of my very favorite things to watch. Um, but it has been so helpful to me. Uh, I, like, and, and so I, I saw that they had a tutorial for cabling without a cable needle. And because I had been having trouble, um, doing that on my Clark sock, um, and I thought that might just be because the, the tension is tighter for a sock. Uh, I thought, well, let me just watch and see if Andrea has any helpful hints on this. Um, and I watched it, and it was a, a sort of different technique than I had found before when I had just Googled cabling without a cable needle and watched whatever video came up on YouTube. Either it was a different technique, or the technique I had learned had somehow morphed in the years, and I had started doing it some other way. That's possible, too. But anyway, what I was doing was not very efficient, and... Um, this way was not only efficient, but the way that she explained it, the way she actually showed why you were doing what you were doing, made it click for me so that I could, um, so that I could remember it well enough that it was so intuitive, I would never have to refer back to it. I would always know, no matter, you know, what the instructions were saying and what kind of cable I was making, I felt like I would know exactly what I was doing. And so on, on this hat, there are some complex cables where you actually cable some knit stitches over some other knit stitches with a purl in the middle. And what that gets you is it gets it to really, really pop. I'm going to take it off again. I knew when I put it back on that was going to be a mistake. Okay, right here. This cable really pops because spread it. It actually has a line of pearls running through the middle there. So not only are you swapping these over, but you also have pearls running through the middle. And if you compare that to, um, spoiler alert, but I'll just, I finished one of my socks. If you compare that to, say, this cable on the sock, there's nothing pearl running in the middle of it. Or on this braid, there's no pearls between these. It's just knits going in different directions. Okay? So that's just a subtle thing that designers will do in their cable patterns to make it pop a little bit more. It makes it a bit more complicated. Um, but when I was doing this, even though Andrea had shown me the technique on a, on a simpler cable, I was able to figure out for myself exactly what I would do to, to do this sort of two crossing with one in the center situation because I felt like I understood it intuitively. So that was huge for me. Um, I do believe she also has a tutorial where she specifically shows you more complex cables such as this one. So you can check that out as well yeah, um, if you feel like you need it. But I highly recommend that. Now, I'm not 100% certain if this actual tutorial is available on her channel um, on its own or if it's part of an episode uh, or if it's I'm almost certain it's not Patreon donors only so I'm a Patreon donor for Fruity Knitting so I watched it on their Patreon because they just sort all of the tutorials that they've ever had 
they're all in a section on Patreon. And um, but it might be. Uh, I'm almost certain it's available to the public, and if it's available as a separate video on the web, on the uh, channel, and not just within an episode, I will try to find it, and I will put it in the show notes, um, which you'll find in the Ravelry group link down there. Um, but if you don't see it in there, then either I forgot, or it's probably in one of their episodes. So, sorry, otherwise I would, I would tell you where to look for it. But, highly recommend Fruity Knitting. So yeah, so... Because I've been cabling without a cable needle, and it's been so, um, it's been made it more intuitive, but, but the big thing is, it's not just that having the cable needle is a little fiddly and it kind of slows you down. It's also that just the actual act of cabling, for me, is so much more enjoyable. The actual movements that you're making, like so much of what I enjoy about certain types of knitting, like how I love brioche, is about the rhythm of it. I love things that involve like slip and then knit and then, you know, like these sort of movements that feel like they go with each other and there's not a whole lot of, you know, moving the yarn to the front and then to the back and then da 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 It's like there's just this, there's... I think we all know, like, there are certain, there's certain textures, types of lace, types of techniques, you know, whether it's, maybe you're really into mosaic or you're into brioche or whatever. They're the ones that have a rhythm that just speaks to you. You just like moving your hands in that way um, versus others. It It's like a dance or something, you know, like there are certain types of dances that we just personally respond to. Um, and I feel like, for me, cabling without a cable needle has a very different rhythm and a, and a different set of movements um, than uh, cabling with a cable needle to the point where, while cabling with a cable needle is something that I sort of dread, cabling without a cable needle is actually, like, one of my favorite things to do knitting-wise. At least it is right now. Like, I'm very much feeling it. And... That is so great because in terms of what I appreciate aesthetically, I adore cables. Like, I really, really, really have been wanting to do some all-over cabled sweaters and, you know, I wanted this cabled hat and I love cabled socks. I just think they're so beautiful. There's something great about them where there's, there's like, it's a subtle complexity right? Like, whereas color work, I feel like it's kind of flashy in a way, because there's different colors going on. Um, cabled sweaters can be really minimal while still being complex, and I, that just really, really speaks to my, um, my personal aesthetic. So, I'm just so thrilled that cabling has gone from something that was, you know, maybe something I would just push through because I wanted the final product, to now being something that I want to do for both product and process reasons, um, which is so great. The last thing I'll say about this hat, you may have noticed, um, it has this faux fur pom-pom on it. I just got it from Amazon. I actually bought um, a packet with a few different ones just because that was like the cheapest way to do it. I don't know. That's how things work in the modern era now, at least in this country. Um, but it's good because I just have them with my knitting stuff now, and when I make hats, if I need pom-poms, I'll just have them there. So it's not a bad stash to have. Um, I did do a really stupid thing when I was trying to attach it. Again, I didn't look up the instructions at all. And it, it came with, um, the pom-pom has one of those, like, elastic loops on it. And so I thought, um, you know, you sew on a button and then you put the loop on it. So I sewed the button on the outside of the hat and then I just put the loop around it thinking that the pom-pom would cover the button but that wasn't what happened the pom-pom was just going off in one direction and the button was fully visible next to the pom-pom so I was like well I did something wrong yes I should actually look up how you're supposed to do this instead of guessing <laughs> so I looked it up and you're supposed to sew the uh, button on the inside of the hat and then pull the elastic through the hole 
at the top of the hat and wrap it around the pom pom on the ins or around the button on the inside of the hat. So I just, you know, not a big deal. Had to cut it off and sew the button on again. I just felt like it was such a such a funny moment because it's like that sort of overconfidence that I don't know if you're like this um, or if other makers are like this, but for me, I I feel like I'm so guilty of you know because I've I've been able to make so many incredible things that in the past I never thought I could have made when there's something simple like putting a pom-pom on a hat or you know I don't know something like that you suddenly just think like well I don't need to look up how to do it I'm a maker I can make anything I've done harder things than this before I've steaked a color work sweater I can sew on a pom-pom let me just do it I don't have to look it up I'm sure I know how to do this and, it, and it's just like a nice humbling <laughs> experience <laughs> to realize that just because you do know how to sew on a button doesn't mean that you actually know how to do the button pom-pom thing itself <laughs> and you can still make like the stupidest mistake. So that's that was funny. I wanted to share that. Okay, so I've been I've been hinting at these and I have so much more to say about them now. Um, I have completed the first sock and I have started the second one. It's be like a few repeats in. Um, got my little Jamie Dodger there, of course. So these are the Clark socks by Jacqueline Salem and um, still completely in love with them. I feel like I want to knit so many more pairs because they are so enjoyable to knit. I talked before about how intuitive the cable is and how um, these sections really set you up to know which part of the repeat you're on and how nice that is. It just makes the whole thing go faster and it makes it, um, it makes it so that this is something that I can knit while I'm having a conversation with someone, which is so great because um, that's what I want my socks for because I like to take them with me. And so I've knit on these uh, this week at Trivia Night. Most of this I got done at a, at a pub trivia event. Um, and I was able to like talk and participate in everything while also knitting a cabled sock because this particular cable design just um, does not require too much thought. Um, I occasionally accidentally cable the wrong direction and then I have to tink back, you know, but... Um, but it, it's it's not bad at all. So the other thing, and I'm really liking the way this color is looking now that you can see the whole sock, just the subtlety of how it fades into some little pinks and um, tans. And then you have these small little areas like right here where you have just a tiny little, right there, just a tiny little speckle. Um, so there were a couple things that I forgot to mention last time. Uh, well, one thing that I needed to update you on was the fact that I am now cabling without a cable needle. I already mentioned that. Um, something I completely forgot to mention was stitch count. So for me, I typically knit my socks at a 56 stitch uh, count for the ankle and the foot. Um, this was written for a 64. I think it's a 64. It's a 60. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's a it's a different stitch count. Um, it's either 60 or 64. Um, and I considered, you know, typically if I'm doing a textured sock, I'll just change it to be my normal stitch count. But because, as I mentioned, these diagonals really set you up perfectly so that when you purl on the second stitch, you know you're on row, sec row two of the cable repeat, right? And if I were to eat up some of those by lowering the stitch count, that wouldn't work anymore. And that, I, I wanted to have that, and I'm so glad I chose to stick with it because it's a big part of what makes these socks so enjoyable and to knit and, and so, you know, easy to, just so intuitive. So I thought about it. I thought about whether I would just eat up all of the stitches at the back and then, you know, this texture would kind of carry over to the back a bit. Um, but what I decided was that I was just going to try doing it at the recommended stitch count because 
cables eat up um, some of your width anyway. And so, you know, a cable is going to be narrower for the, the stitch count than something that's not cabled. And so I knew it wasn't going to be quite as big as a regular 60 stitch count sock would be, or 64, whichever it actually is. Um, so I thought I would just try it. And I knew I could try it on as I went along and, and make sure the ankle wasn't like way too big on me. So I did that. I think that's been going fine. Um, but then for the foot, I was taking away the back cable because I, you know, you just want a vanilla thing to stand on. And so there was going to be, you know, this cable isn't eating up a ton of space, but it is a cable. And, uh, and also I knew that the foot, it's even more important that the foot be tight enough and not overly loose, um, in order to, to get a good fit on your sock. Um, so I wanted to come down on the foot to my, either my regular stitch count. No. I think what I did was I came down on the foot to have the reg, yeah, I came down on the foot to have the regular stitch count across the back, but the normal stitch count across the front. So I made it so that I had like 28 stitches on the back, which is what I would normally have for a 56 stitch uh, sock, but I continued to have the regular amount on the front. So essentially I was now knitting a stitch count that was between um, where the ankle was and where I would normally be. Um, and I did that right at the fish lips kiss heel, which of course this isn't in the pattern in Jacqueline Salem's pattern. This is just my preferred heel. I did the modification where I make it narrower, although I am starting to think that it might be a little bit too narrow now and I, I'm on my next pair of socks. I'm going to maybe back off and do it a little bit wider. But anyway, um, when I got through the heel, I just decreased. was it right before the heel? I think I did, yeah, it looks like I decreased right before the heel. Again, I did not write this down, and so when I started the second sock, I went, oh gosh, I need to go back and read my knitting and see, <laughs> see what I did, because <laughs> I kind of just made it up as I went along. But it's looking like I decreased before the heel. Um, so then I would be knitting that heel at my regular stitch count, which would be good because I know that heel fits. And then um, the bottom of the foot continues to be my regular stitch count while the top is a little bigger. And the only place that this became a problem was when I got to the toe, I was almost at the end of kitchenering it when I remembered that I had a different stitch count on the back needle than the front needle. So a Kitchener would not work. Um, <laughs> so I had to undo the Kitchener and then decrease um, the toe stitches properly and then then get to where I could Kitchener. So it, it's been a little uh, a little uh, touch and go, but <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's worked fine. Um, and I just think they're so beautiful. And I really have been enjoying working on them. So um, lots of modifications <laughs> made on the fly. And hopefully I will make the same modifications to the second sock. <laughs> Nothing too bad that I can really tell the difference. Um, the other thing I'm doing on the second sock is I am reversing the direction of all the cables, which is a modification I'm making. So the pattern just asks you to do the exact same uh, chart, but um, I don't know how well you can tell with the braid, but you can probably tell better here. Uh, one cable is going in one direction and the other is going in the other direction. So that's, a, that's the change that I made. And essentially what I did was, um, Jacqueline had written it to where for most of, for all of the cables on the back and most of the cables in the braid, the majority of the braid cables, you would cable back and um, then sometimes you would cable front. And so I did that for the first sock and for the second sock, I'm turning all of those into cable front and I'm turning the occasional cable fronts into cable backs. My initial instinct for doing this was that when cabling with a, without a cable needle, I find that 
um, cabling front is so much easier because you don't have to bring your yarn to the front at all. You just keep your yarn in back the whole time as you slip those stitches. Um, as you slip them back, just yarn stays in the back the whole time. But when you cable back without a cable needle, there's a point at which you need to bring your yarn front. And when you're first getting used to it, you might occasionally forget to bring your yarn front and then your yarn ends up going through the cable in this weird way and you have to get it out again. So because I was enjoying the cable fronts more than the cable backs, I thought, my first thought was, well, I'm definitely going to turn the back cable into all cable fronts because why not? It'll essentially look the same, but just in the opposite direction. And then I realized that might even look better because um, they'll be symmetrical. So then I thought, well, on the braid, I have to cable both front and back, but there's no reason why I can't make the majority cable fronts. And then that'll also be symmetrical. So that's what I did. So it initially came out of just what I wanted to do. And then it ended up being a choice that I think makes them look cuter. Um, so that's cool. I like that. Uh, in the future, I might continue if when I make these socks, I might continue to, to, um, mirror image the cable patterns. Um, or I might just do all of them the way that I enjoy the process of, which is just more cable fronts than cable backs. I don't know. It'll probably depend on my mood at the time. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that she wrote it for more cable backs because I do think that cabling with a cable needle, I think most knitters prefer a cable back. They find it to be less fiddly to hold your stitches on that cable needle at the back of the work. So it is interesting that when you swap to do it without a cable needle, the cable front becomes um, the sort of simpler version. So that's kind of, kind of interesting. It makes me wonder if I looked at a cable chart, um, if I could just tell, like I'm assuming Jacqueline cables with a cable needle based on the fact that she wrote her cables that way. And I wonder, like looking at a cable chart, if you could guess whether the designer was writing it with a cable needle or um, without a cable needle in mind, just based on how many, you know, when they chose to go cable front and cable back. I mean, there are obviously some charts where there's reasons to do both, but um, there are some, like that cable at the back, where it's really just a random choice. And so you would think you would choose the one that you preferred to do. So anyway, <laughs> this is like, I feel like this episode is all about the minutia of like knitting and stitch patterns. <laughs> okay, so the next whip that I have to share with you, I have done... I don't remember if I've done anything on this since you've seen it. I don't think I've done anything, but I did want to show you just to update you because this is going to be like, you're probably going to be seeing a lot more of this um, very soon. So here's your update. This is the swag by Caitlin Hunter. And um, right now it looks like nothing. <laughs> this is a yoked sweater. It has this color work at the top and then it has this contrast color lacy yoke um and then it's going to have a little bit of color work and then it's going to have um some one by one cable textures uh which i'm actually going to use twisted stitches for instead because that is faster and they're all over the entire body and sleeves um which is also an idea i got from fruited knitting it looks almost exactly the same um yeah, and I'm still very excited about this. I am loving the yarn. Looking at it right now, I just absolutely love the way these two yarns go together. The way that the blues and pinks that you can kind of see heathered in this Shetland are kind of picked up in the in the um, dye, the hand dye um, job on the other yarn. It's just it's just great. So. Um, this is Mad Fuzzy, by the way, and this is uh, Jameson's, uh, Jameson's of Shetland. But yeah, the only reason that I have not been working on this baby is that I have been primarily cranking on my Tecumseh, which is almost done, and I will show you that now. So the Tecumseh is also by Caitlin Hunter because I have a problem, and I 
<laughs> I even worked on this this week when I was, so Monday we recorded Return to Stars Hollow and I'm supposed to work on uh, my, my designated Return to Stars Hollow project, which is my third Caitlin Hunter sweater, <laughs> The Sunset Highway. Um, but on Monday I had high hopes that I could actually finish this to come set in time to wear it on the, on the, uh, recording of today for the show. Um, so I let myself work on it on Monday. Now this week did not go exactly as planned and I did not get as much knitting in as I thought I would. So what we have is nearly a sweater, but we're, we're sure one sleeve which is fine. It's good. I had the hat to wear, so I'm happy. <laughs> but, um, but that's the story on that. Uh, I've been just cranking on this, this puppy. Um, I, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure I could have finished it if I had, if I, if I were knitting at the rate that I had been knitting maybe last year or something, but, um, I have a lot of other stuff going on right now, and that's okay. It's okay to do that. It's not a race. So, um, this is done with Mad Tosh, and so I followed a similar color scheme to what Caitlin Hunter wrote in the pattern, but I kind of did my own thing with it by going for Mad Tosh, and so um, instead of just this black, you have this beautiful sort of uh, oil slick color where it reads black from far away but you get up close and you can see lots of colors in it including a kind of a rusty burnt orangey that reminds me of this color I chose. It's got all these lovely brown speckles in it and then the background color which reads from gray as gray from far away if you look at it up close it's really got lots of pinks and purples in it and almost a mother of pearl quality. Um, so keep finding, do you guys ever like knit your own hairs into your work? I always find like these long hairs of mine that are following <laughs> the path of the knitted stitches. And so they're like really hard to pull out. It's so ridiculous. Um, my hair gets everywhere. So that's just, that's just it. So anyway, this guy is going to be like a big old swan show-ish fit. You know, the, uh, the yoke comes way down to like here on me. Um, and it has these very short little sleeves, you know, which are, they read as, as three quarter length, but because the yoke is so long, they take no time to do, which means since I only have one sleeve left and very close, um, it doesn't look great right now because the color work is all bunchy and um, that is because <laughs> I realize I need to make peace with the fact that I need to change my needle size when I do color work on a project that also has stockinette. I just need to recognize that I have to do that. Um, I thought my gauge was the same for both. I have measured my gauge in both when I did um, the EBA, but apparently it's not. I don't know. I change the way that I knit my color work just constantly because I'm not happy with any with how any technique works. Like I go from doing it with two hands to just sort of dropping and picking up with my left hand. Um, just back and forth, and I and so I think who knows like what my gauge really is because I don't really have a standard. I'm a, I, I'm a terrible color work knitter. Like, that's just a fact. I'm not good at it. Um, I'm not fast. Um, <laughs> I don't have good tension. <laughs> um, sometimes I just decide that I'm not going to catch my floats because I don't feel like looking up how to do it again. Um, I'm just not, I'm not good at it. And the fact of the matter is that I really, really, really do want to get good at it, but I feel that I need to learn how to tension my yarn better for regular knitting, um, to do that proper picking practice that I've talked in the past about wanting to do. I, I'm going to find some time to make that a priority eventually. And when I feel like I am 
properly tensioning the yarn with my left hand, I can then take the time to learn how to properly tension the yarn with my right hand and flick um, so that I can actually pick and flick and do it two-handed. And I think that'll be lovely and wonderful. Um, but I kind of am at the point where, I, at least in this moment, and you know, if I see more color work projects that I just have to do at that moment, I'll do what I did with this, which is like, just do it, even though it's not great. It doesn't look great. Um, but, I, but right now what I'm feeling like I want to do is kind of take several seats <laughs> and not start another major all over color book, color work sweater. I have yarn for the Alyeska, which I have long said I am saving until I'm a better color work knitter. And I do want to do that sweater. But what I want to do first is actually discipline myself to tension the yarn properly and do it properly. Um, and that is not my first priority right now. And I need to recognize that. I need to recognize that like, I want to have fun with my knitting and it's, it's de-stressing and I don't have as much time to knit as I wish I did and all of that stuff. And when I have some more extra time, maybe around the holidays and I can kind of work on tensioning my yarn and getting myself to a better spot and then maybe work on learning the right hand, I will be in a position where I feel good about doing an all over color work sweater and it's not a chore and it doesn't hurt my hands and it doesn't feel like I'm going so slow and I'm not leaving, you know, bad floats that aren't caught and all that kind of thing. So. I'm happy with like doing a poor job and knitting this. It's fine. I really, really wanted this product and it'll mainly just block out and look fine. The blocking is going to help a lot and it'll be fine. I'm not worried about it. But that being said, as far as process goes, I didn't love doing this because I felt like I was so slow and I just felt like I was doing a poor job and I just don't like feeling that way. So. Um, I think I'm like taking a bit of a pause in the color work until I have time to really prioritize improving my technique. And that's a personal choice, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're all different and some people are just going to be like, no, just keep knitting it sloppy, it doesn't matter. And I agree that it doesn't matter, I don't regret knitting this sweater sloppily, it's fine. But um, I just don't enjoy it as much. And I think like right now I'm super into cables, I feel confident about cables. I'm going to spend some time doing some cable sweaters. It's going to be fine. And I'm going to, you know, practice picking properly on some swatches instead of projects where I have like low stakes for how my tension looks. And um, I'm going to try to improve my technique. That is something I really want to do for me. So I hope I didn't rant about that for too long. But anyway, not meant to be a downer at all because this sweater is honestly gorgeous. The yarn and the design, it would be impossible for it to not be gorgeous and I cannot wait to wear it. A little block is all it's going to need to um, to look much better. And uh, my floats, I will say something I have been doing, which I'm, I'm a little bit proud of, is I have been mostly weaving in my ends as I go. Which, and this is the theme of the episode, I learned to do from Andrea of Fruity Knitting. <laughs> so it's not that hard. Really, all you do is you just take that end and, and as you knit with the other color, you go under it and then over it, under it and then over it. That's all it is. If that doesn't make sense to you, highly recommend Fruity Knitting and you can see it done. But what it does is, right here you can see, this is where I joined. Is that where I started it? Yeah, this is where I started this color. And all I have to do is trim this in now because right there is it getting woven in before I was ready to start it. And then I just started it. And then here at the end, here's where I stopped it. And there it is getting woven in again. So that's pretty awesome. Especially if I want to do like all over fair isle you know with a ton of colors one day which i i would very much like to do one day um that takes out a lot of the weaving in of the ends so that's great um i started doing that a little ways down so 
uh, there are some ends up top that still need to be woven in. And then there's this ridiculousness, which is that I ran out of one ball of yarn literally as I was casting off the cuff. So I had to join another one. And you can't do that trick on a cast off row. <laughs> um, so that was annoying, <laughs> but whatever, it's fine. So yeah, this guy will be done real soon and you'll probably see it on the Instagram. And then uh, I'm sure I'll be wearing it next month on the show. So watch the space, as they say. So for On the Horizon, um, I'm definitely kind of feeling a bit of sweater monogamy right now. And not strictly monogamy, because obviously I have multiple sweaters going at this moment. And I probably will have multiple sweaters in the future. But um, like kind of focusing on one at a time is sort of where I've been. I've been neglecting the the Zweig while I focus on the Tecumseh and I want to work on the Zweig next um, and uh, you know the Sunset Highway doesn't exactly count because that's my designated Return to Stars Hollow project but we will be finishing up Return to Stars Hollow um, pretty soon in like a month and a half so then I'm probably going to dedicate some time to finishing that but uh, I have a couple others in mind that I'm hoping to cast on soon um, and I think what I'm probably going to do is just let myself cast on stuff and then either that takes over and I'll start neglecting the Zweig again or I will finish up the Zweig and then get to that. It doesn't really matter which way, but, um, you know, just really staying focused on these, on these sweaters and not having too many of them all at once is kind of where I'm at. Um, but I'm very excited to be doing cables. So... The Zweig has, of course, this little one-by-one -one cables, which I'm going to do as twisted stitches, uh, just in the interest of time and efficiency. Um, although I love twisted stitches as well. Very fun. Um, but even if I was doing them as cables, that wouldn't really fit the bill for the sort of all-over cable goodness that I got with this hat that I've really been wanting to have again. Um, there are a couple sweaters that I have in mind. Obviously, I've been talking about the stone cutter for forever, and um, I might do that sometime soon. I'm not sure. But I also was recently kind of reassessing my wardrobe and trying to think about what sweater I might knit next in terms of what space I actually have in my wardrobe and, like, things that I actually need. Um, <laughs> imagine that. And I realized, like, I could use some structured sweaters. Not, like, big drapey around the house sweaters, but I could use some sweaters that I could wear as a layering item the way that I wear blazers or something um, that I could wear to work that would go with an outfit and have a little bit of structure. Um, and so I started kind of looking through my favorited sweaters with that in mind and also looking for cables. And a couple things stood out, one that's all over cables and one that looks like it's all over cables, but I think it is mostly, if not all, twisted stitches. And that would be, uh, so the twisted stitch one is the Petal by Marie Wallen. Um, and then the all over cables is Geiger by Nora Gone, who also did this hat. Uh, Nora Gone, I would say, is my favorite designer in terms of her aesthetic. And it's weird because this hat is actually, I believe, the first Nora Gone thing that I've ever knit, simply because most of my favorite things of hers are sweaters and they tend to be all over cable and, and they've just been a little bit intimidating to me. But I, I feel like I'm at a point where I'm ready to dive into those. So that's very exciting. Um, and I think that that is definitely going to be in my future, um, either the pedal or the guy or both and maybe the stone cutter. Um, I want to do the Geiger in this arbor as well. That's what it was designed for. And I'm not sure about the color yet, but I really love some of their new colors a lot. And then um, the uh, petal is designed for Rowan Felted Tweed, which I think is a wool and hemp blend. And I've looked it up. I like it a lot. I haven't exactly found a color that I'm loving and I haven't worked with that yarn before but it does look beautiful. Another thing I'm considering is I've really really been wanting to try the new Lore from the Fiber Co um, which is also a DK weight uh, kind of a heathery I think more of a heathery than a tweedy look but I think that could be very beautiful as a petal as well um, so that's something I was considering and then the stone cutter of course would be done 
in the yarn it's written for, which is the um, Shelter by Brooklyn Tweed, which is probably my favorite yarn, um, if I had to pick one. Yesterday I was wearing my first ever sweater that I knit, uh, which is the Kodo by um, Olga Baraya Kathelian out of beautiful Brooklyn Tweed Shelter. Um, and I was remembering as I wore it and experiencing it, how sheepy it smells. Like that's part of why I say that the, the shelter and the, um, well, I assume the fingering weight because it's the same blend, although I haven't worked with it. But the shelter is more rustic and, and sheepier than this Arbor. Um, wearing that sweater, even though I've washed it several times and I've had it <laughs> for like um, a year and a half, it still smells like a sheep when I wear it. It still feels like Ryan was giving me a shoulder rub while I was wearing it and he said the lanolin in the sweater was softening his hands. Like it is, it's the real stuff. <laughs> so it's so fun to work with and it's so enjoyable to wear a sweater that's made out of that. Uh, so I would definitely love to have another one of those. 100% would make my stone cutter out of it. And I had been thinking I wanted the stone cutter in cast iron, which is like almost a black color, but the more I thought about it, all of the work that's going into those cables, I want the cables to show up as well as possible. And I know cables look better in a lighter color. Um, so I think I have actually changed my mind on that. And then I will use the postcard colorway, which is the really beautiful uh, kind of grayish lavender color that has some tweed speckles of like, almost reds and blues. Um, it's one of my favorite colorways that that yarn comes in as well. And I, I know it would make a beautiful stone cutter, so I might go that direction. But anyway, that's everything that I'm thinking about um, for what's coming up uh, this, this cult season. And I have something else that I wanna share with you. Now, I've not been doing stash enhancement on the show, but I decided I wanted to share something I'm calling stack enhancement. Um, the stack is my stack of books that I haven't read. Uh, that's what I call it. I have a, I have a shelf on uh, Goodreads called the stack and that's what that means for me. And this is a little bit of stack enhancement. Um, so lovely. Alice Starmore, Tudor Roses. Um, this is a conflation of nerdy interests and I doubt I am the only person who is very into both knitting and um, Tudor history. <laughs> These are all sweaters that are inspired by Tudor women um, and it's amazing. So let's say it all together. I found out about this from, ready? One, two, three. Fruity Knitting. I did. I found out about this from Fruity Knitting. Okay, so here's why all the Fruity Knitting this episode. I have been watching them for a long time, but recently I decided to start walk, watching the back catalog. So I have been watching several episodes a week. <laughs> that is why all the Fruity Knitting. But in an early episode, Andrea shares this book. Um, she has knit a few patterns think a few patterns from it. The one that I know she's knit, and it's my favorite as well, and definitely a long-term goal of mine, is the Anne Boleyn, which is completely insane. It is this sort of cardigan that's almost like a blazer. It's inspired by like riding clothing. And here you go. And it has these vertical stripes that are done with intarsia, and they are bobbles all the way up. And then this sort of section and the cuffs are actually done with a combination of intarsia, stranded knitting, cabling, and bobbling. And I think something else, maybe something else, all in a single row. So Andrea said that was like the most complicated thing she'd ever done was just these little sections. I think it looks like a, I just think it looks like an absolutely wonderful challenge. 
Um, I do like the finished project, uh, the finished garment, um, but that would not be my primary um, motivation for this. My primary motivation is that I would love to try all of these techniques and this just looks like a Mount Everest for me and it's like I just want to climb it because it's there. So I don't know if and when this will be happening but this is definitely going on my list of um, long-term knitting goals for myself. Now the, the book in general is just lovely. It opens with a little sonnet written in period language <laughs> about what you're about to see, you know, like the, um, like the kind of Romeo and Juliet, um, what do they call that? Like, it's not like the, not like a foreword, but like it would be a foreword in a book. Prologue, the prologue. And then, um, oh, so this is the second edition. This was first published in 1996, 1998, I think, and they updated it um, to make the designs a little bit more modern. So this is the 2013. So it has a bit about the new edition. Um, then it has a bit about the Tudors, and you get this great family tree so that you can see how all the different women that are inspired the different garments are related to each other. And then you get into the designs, and for each of the designs, it has like, they pose them. I mean, the, the art in this, the photography, the styling, amazing. They pose these women like in a way that's completely inspired by the portraits of these actual people. And then it has like little biographies that tell you where the inspiration came from, you know, why this specific garment feels like her. And, it, and it's cool because like, it does look like period clothing, but you can also imagine it working with a pair of jeans and just being completely modern as well. And that's really the idea behind all of these. And um, I just think, I just think just as a book to read, I'm totally into this, but I definitely want to knit the Anne Boleyn at least. And, um, and it's just a wonderful thing to have. I, don't, I do not buy a lot of pattern books because I just don't feel the need to own things personally unless they bring me a lot of joy. But this is really there for me, this Jane Seymour. I mean, it looks so, it looks so, um, I want to say Elizabethan. Of course, that's not exactly right because uh, Jane Seymour would have been just before Elizabeth's reign. But, um, but it's so uh, old-fashioned and... Um, I guess Renaissance, Renaissance, I think Renaissance would be a correct term. I apologize if I'm wrong about that. But like these little, this little, tech, you know, I mean, I'm sure that's way too much for some people, but it's just fun. It's, they're, they're just fun. I love, I love the concept and the execution is incredible. Um, this designer is like one of the, one of the best. She's a real professional and her daughter did some of the designs as well. And there is a range. I mean, there's, there's some of the things are, are a little bit simpler, you know, like they're not super crazy. Like here's the, uh, this is the one inspired by Queen Elizabeth I. So it, so there's a huge range from how complicated they can be. And there's all kinds of different techniques. Like this one, um, you can see has color work and texture. There are some all over color work ones. Um, so I really think it's, it's just a great book and I'm thrilled to have it and I'm really excited to dive even deeper into it because um, I've really just been able to turn through it so far. It came in the mail a few days ago. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's that. Wanted to share that. Um, and I guess that brings me into my chit chat segment. So it is fall here. Um, it's feeling like fall, and that is so exciting to me. Um, and I just wanted to share a few of the kind of autumnal things that I've been doing lately and um, what's been going on in, in terms of that. So I have been wearing a lot of my hand knits a lot more, which is great because it's been cooler. Um, and we went to our very first, uh, Ryan and I went to our first Fiber Festival, um, the Wool Gathering, which is near here in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Um, it's not enormous, um, but it was wonderful. They had alpaca and 
llamas and multiple breeds of sheep, including Shetland. Um, and they had uh, a an Angora goat, which is where we get mohair from. Um, and Angora rabbits, no relation, uh, which is where we get Angora fiber from. Um, and it was just... It was just such a joy. Brian really enjoyed getting to uh, pet the alpaca and feel how soft they were and how friendly they were. Um, I mean, I did as well, uh, but he, he was he was excited to accompany me. And um, I got this little sample that I wanted to show you guys. This is from a Shetland sheep. Here's the company, if you're interested. They sell um, wool in various states for spinners and they sell some yarn as well. And uh, I just can't, like, I just fell in love with the touch of it. It's so springy. Like, I knew how wonderful Shetland wool was from knitting with it, but seeing it in its raw state was really, really pretty cool. So anyway, I have tiny highlights of this on Instagram. I have them in my highlighted roll of my, um, my stories, which you can find. And, um... Yes, yeah, so that was fun. That was a few weekends ago, I believe. And then maybe a few weeks from now. Oh, so I am planning on doing Vlogtober just for the weekends. I wanted to say that. Um, so one of the things that you'll see is a few weekends from now, we're going to go to the Renaissance Festival, the Ohio Renaissance Festival, which we did not do last year, so you didn't get to see it. Um, but we do fairly regularly. I've been going since I was pretty young, and um, it is definitely one of my favorite things to do in the fall. I like to go once the weather cools off a little bit and uh, it's all outdoors and um, it's just a real fun time. So I will definitely be vlogging that for Vlogtober along with whatever other uh, fun October weekend stuff I get up to. Um, and then something else we did recently that was amazing was uh, we went foraging for mushrooms for the first time. So this is another long-term goal that I have had, and I've been reading up on identifying the edible mushrooms that are in this area, as well as, very importantly, um, being able to identify the most deadly mushrooms, as well as mushrooms that might be in any way similar to the edible kind that we're looking for, um, but would be, you know, not tasty or not edible. So just kind of, uh, I, bought, I bought a guidebook, and I read a lot of resources online, and I read in the guidebook, and... Um, learned all about that. We went out um, thinking we were going to try to find chanterelles and that if we were really lucky, we would find uh, maybe some sets, um, which is what the French call them. Uh, a lot of people call them porcini is the Italian name, and I believe the British call them um, penny buns, penny buns, I want to say. They are one of the most delicious and sought after wild mushrooms that there are. So we did, we, we went hiking, it was a few weeks ago, and it had been raining like crazy, and the only day that we had off together was the Saturday where it was still raining, and we decided we were going to go even though it was raining. So we put on rain jackets, and we carried umbrellas, and we wore um, wellies, and we <laughs> went and hiked in the muddy forest, and we found mushrooms um and it was just a blast like it was a little kooky to be out there in the pouring rain anyway much less looking for mushrooms but we were both excited about it and like we had so much fun um and we found not just chanterelles but we found several seps so I was so thrilled we brought them home uh made sure with the guidebooks that we had found what we thought we found um and then I cleaned them up and chopped them up and made a delicious mushroom risotto that we had for dinner that night. And um, it was just like the perfect fall activity. I have been wanting to do it for so long and it was really, really fun. Um, so the final little piece of uh, fall goodness that I wanted to share um, is that I found this new podcast called Chop Bard which has been going on for years. Um, basically, this Shakespearean expert, he's uh, an actor, um, and I'm not sure if he has any degree in literature, but he certainly is an expert at, um, you know, picking apart Shakespeare and, uh, you know, talking about it. Um, so he, he basically does plays, Shakespearean plays, um, where he takes a few scenes at a time per episode. 
and uh, he'll go through the whole play and he reads all of it, um, talks about what different confusing words um, mean or like what people might think they mean or in the first folio it said this but people think it was in this print. Cool little details like that, tells you about cultural stuff, really helps you understand it, um, and just has such a cool take on them. I just love the way he talks about Shakespeare. I'm a big Shakespeare fan. I used to um, be an actor and I, I studied Shakespeare in college for my creative writing degree as well as um, for my uh, for literature credits and um, I've just always been a huge fan since I was a kid actually. Uh, but I it never occurred to me to like find a Shakespeare podcast. Um, and actually the way that it came up is that there is this Slate miniseries going on, miniseries podcast called Lend Me Your Ears, which is really great where they uh, do a different play per episode and I think they've just done like three or four. They're not going to do all of them, but they talk about the play and what it says about um, modern day politics, which is really cool. And that got me thinking, I really want to, like, I loved that podcast, so I wanted to listen to another podcast on Shakespeare, and that was how I found Chat Bard. Um, and I started with Macbeth because um, I, I was doing this, like, several weeks ago, so it was totally, like, just the beginning of September, but I was like, yeah, it's Halloween season. Let's go, Macbeth. Um, that's how excited I am about fall. So I was listening to it. I actually posted about this on Instagram. You may have seen because I had my um, had my Halloween cookie progress keeper that's like a little ghost, and I was knitting on this hat. Um, and I would wake up early in the morning on these first cold mornings of the year and listen to Macbeth and knit on this hat with my little Halloween progress keeper. And oh man, it was just so wonderful. Like fall so much. I love cold weather and knitting and Shakespeare. Um, but yeah, highly recommend if you're interested in Shakespeare at all. You can really pick up anywhere, go to whichever play you want to do. I'm going to do King Lear next um, because I am, well, it's a great one, and I'm really excited that there is an uh, Amazon adaptation of King Lear with Anthony Hopkins, so that's obviously going to be great. Um, so I want to watch that, so I was thinking I would do King Lear first, and then um, Ryan has actually just finished reading Station Eleven at my recommendation. I read it a few years ago, and King Lear plays a part in that as well. So he was saying he would be interested in watching the Anthony Hopkins adaptation with me. So I'm doing King Lear next, very much in the mood for that, but I think he's done a lot, if not all, of the histories already. Um, he's done Romeo and Juliet, I think that was the first one, uh, Hamlet. Macbeth, obviously, I mentioned, I think, A Winter's Tale, um, The Tempest, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. I think those are all the ones he's covered so far. So there's just a bevy of riches for anyone who wants to uncover it. If you like listening to podcasts, and if you are even Shakespeare curious, I really think if you have been interested in Shakespeare, but you're not really sure how to get into it because um, it's kind of a huge learning curve to just sit down with a book and start reading, this is definitely the podcast for you. A ton of high school teachers are using it in their classrooms to help their kids get into Shakespeare. It makes it very, very, very accessible, but it doesn't dumb it down at all. Um, so I really, really, really recommend that podcast if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and it's just the perfect thing to listen to in the fall, even if it's not Macbeth, just because it's there's something really cozy about it, I guess. Um, so great thing to listen to while you're knitting, cooking, driving, doing whatever. Um, and now I'm finally ready to shut up. I feel like I've had so much stuff to talk about today. Um, and I already had like kind of a exhausted voice when I started because I was reading out loud all morning. Um, <laughs> Ryan and I sometimes read books together and we, uh, we just finished one. So I was reading that out loud this morning. <sighs> I think I'm about ready to stop talking for like the rest of the day. So <laughs> I probably won't. I'll probably just yammer on forever because that's what I do, but my voice hurts. So thank you so much for tuning in again. Um, great to catch up. Make sure you leave me a comment with any questions uh, or just things you want to contribute to say. I love hearing from you guys and it's a big way that I know that you're out there listening, which is um, why I'm here. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up if you do find 
uh, this show to be valuable in any way. It basically just lets YouTube know that it's valuable, and so um, they will recommend it to other people that are interested in similar content. So that helps me out a lot, and helps other people find me too. Um, so I really, really appreciate that, and uh, thank you for watching, thanks for subscribing, thanks for all that stuff, and I will see you in Vlogtober, and then um, I will see you in about a month for another regular episode, hopefully wearing my Tecumseh.